Um, so we are very happy to see you here this night. So first of all, let me offer my thanks to uh, Open Russia for their continuous support and to Skyscraper Sky Publishers and Carl Salvag in particular for inviting Victor and for co-organizing this event. So I am particularly honored on behalf of the ARC Anglo-Russian Culture Club uh, to introduce tonight's speaker Victor Sonkin, who is very special to us in, in many ways. I'll show you why in a second. So if you're not familiar with the Anglo-Russian Culture Club or the ARC, uh, let me just say a couple of words. So we are trying to present uh, significant scholars, uh, academics, artists and musicians, both Russian and the UK ones, and European, so it doesn't really matter. We are trying to maintain some sort of critical dialogue. Uh, we are also, uh, we, we've just started running a sort of informal uh, Russian film studies club, so we'll see how it works, because it's been, uh, it's caused a lot of different reactions, and the bilingual theater, which has also been quite special. And obviously, translation, both in literal sense and in a very, in a wider sense, lies <laughs> at the uh, core and at the heart of our activities. That's why we have a whole series devoted to translation. And Victor has just started it. He's going to introduce his book, which, by the way, he has self-translated uh, here with Rome. And uh, tomorrow we'll run again another event for the first time, which will be a masterclass of workshop. Uh, with Viktor Sonkin and Alexander Berisenko, they will co-teach literary translation for two days. And on Monday, uh, we'll have Alex Dr. Alexander Berisenko presenting on, on Tuesday, I'm sorry, okay. uh, who is going to present on British children's literature in Russia. Uh, I think uh, adaptation, uh, censorship and all sort of other interesting problems arising in translation. <coughs> so please, if you haven't booked those events and if you are interested in them, uh, please have a look and do so. And uh, Victor is a very special speaker for many reasons. First of all, uh, I would say I'll try to pretend that I have a very neat uh, bullet points and a whole list. But first of all, I think he's probably one of the very few people uh, with a sort of cultural authority who doesn't seem to believe that we are all going to hell and things are going to hell and young people are continuously brainwashed and well, their brains are already eroded because of Facebook and Google and uh, so in, in fact I think he has quite, it seems to again, judging by his writing, to have quite a belief in uh, well, young people and he's absolutely right. He'll probably demonstrate tonight why Romans had many more reasons to conjure up all those images of gloom and doom and to also make you feel that Romans were your contemporaries and the other way around, perhaps. And Victor is indeed quite a polymath in every sense of the word because he is a scholar, a writer, a translator and uh, while well, he actually studied Slavistics uh, to begin with, in particular Serbian and Croatian literature focusing on prosody uh, but then, he's obviously, as you might know, he translates from English uh, quite a lot with uh, Alexander Borisenko. Uh, he's known as a translator of Julian Barnes, and uh, they're finishing the second book of Hanya Yanagihara. The first one was uh, Little, Li uh, Little Life, and the second one is uh, People in uh, the Trees. Uh, and a lot of them, um, a lot of uh, co-translation with, with students, uh, of detective British and American fiction, uh, and Ale Victor and Alexandra also uh, teach a seminar at Moscow State University. And here there is a very strange thing, because Victor actually excels at everything. There are two different camps among translators. Uh, there are translators and interpreters, and, so, and they seem sometimes to clash both temperamentally and in terms of their scholarly pursuits, and Victor actually manages to do both. So he, he worked as a conference interpreter at the International Tribunal of the Hague, translating from Serbian into English, and he still does a lot of uh, simultaneous interpreting or conference interpreting, which as you can imagine requires a very different pace from a literary translator and writer. Uh, and finally, Victor won one of the most important awards in Russia for uh, called Enlightenment Award, 
which I think is really well deserved because he is really wonderful at popularizing really important things without really compromising on well, meticulous scholarly quality. So without any further ado, I'll, I would like you to welcome Victor and we'll have probably questions, uh, some sort of conversation afterward on how Sabag is publishing and written. Uh, we'll probably talk more and we'll have some sort of discussion afterward. Thank you very much. Please welcome Victor Sonic. <laughs> to begin with real heartfelt thanks to <coughs> everyone who's been helping me. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. It's okay. Um, to everyone who's been helping me uh, writing, <coughs> translating, researching this book, but especially uh, regarding its uh, English language edition to Carl Sabach, my um, publisher, and to Natasha Bankia of the Banki Gumenzman Novel Literary Agency, who kind of brokered the deal. <clears throat> so, basically, what I'm going to do today is just to introduce you to my book, which is basically a kind of a stroll around ancient Rome. Uh, the problem with that is that books of that kind used to be written, uh, especially in, in England, um, about a hundred years ago. Uh, but during the last decades, uh, they um, kind of spilled into two completely different categories, and one was a very uh, academic affairs, like the archaeological guides to Rome, for example, the wonderful guide by Amanda Claridge, or another one translated from Italian by Filippo Guarelli, which are absolutely brilliant, but you cannot read them for pleasure. These are not the books that you just read because you want to read something interesting about ancient Rome. Uh, they are necessary if you want to find out what, where this stone comes from. And the other kind of uh, literature that uh, appears in that place are books for children, which mostly imagine that time travel is possible. And so this is something like Ancient Roman Five Binaria Day, uh, and many other books like that of that kind by Philip Matashek or Alberto Angela. Uh, and again, there is no middle ground, there is nothing that comes in between and it used to be written by Augustus Hare, for example, or by Morton um, 80 or, or so years ago. Uh, and there was nothing in Russian at all, so I thought that this kind of uh, guidebook that would lead the uh, reader into, into um, into the millennia, into the old era, while giving him or her the kind of touch and feel for place, uh, is something that is very necessary. <clears throat> so, uh, if you Google image room, you mostly see the images of Colosseum, uh, a bit of the Forum, Trevi Fountain, and Vatican, and very occasionally also the Pantheon. Uh, and that's about it, that's all that you see on the first couple of, couple of pages. Uh, and uh, most of the side, sites are very well known. Most of them are also paid attractions, so you have to pay to see the, the, in the forum now and the Colosseum. And since sometime this year, the Pantheon is going to be a paid uh, venue as well, unfortunately. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today uh, are other things that you don't have to pay for and that you can basically just walk around. Rome is not very large. <clears throat> Ancient Rome as such uh, and the, uh, the city that is surrounded with walls uh, is something that you can walk through in one day easily and leisurely. And uh, you can go to Rome a lot and never ride the metro. I think I've never, no, I have, but very rarely. 
really natural in Rome, uh, which is ridiculous living today anyway, it's just two lines and they're not very, uh, very uh, spread. Uh, buses and uh, other public transportation, but again, it's very limited and in summer, when there are more tourists in the city, there are fewer buses. So, uh, taxis well sometimes, but you have to be careful and you have to argue with the taxis sometimes. But if you just walk around the room, uh, it's quite possible and it's possible to create a route that will take you around the city in one day or less and show you some of the ancient marvels that are relatively less known. Um, and for those marvels, you wouldn't need any tickets or anything. So, this is the map of Rome. And this is the actual, well, the, uh, not the uh, photograph, but a map. And you can see that there are some of the points uh, which I will try to take you around, starting from <coughs> that point which is up there, which is which says Termini. And Termini is the name of Rome's railway station. Uh, the initial version of this presentation, which uh, in somewhat modified form I gave in Russia, uh, had a lot of pictures showing the whole route of that. And, uh, that caused some of the viewers to, uh, to have some kind of headaches or, uh, or uh, other physiological um, <laughs> effect. So I cut most of, the, of those. Uh, so this is just a, an idea of going through Rome, but it's not a complete uh, a complete pop. But you start, we'll start from, from the Termini, and this is, uh, there is even a nice touch to that because if you, as you just arrived into the city, and this is the place where most of the cheapest accommodations are around. Well, now these days with Airbnb and other uh, similar services, it's probably not that necessary, but still, this is uh, the place which is quite central and where you can find many cheap hotels. Uh, and right next to the railway station there is even a section of a very old wall uh, with marks in the shape of Greek letters because at the time, around the second century BC, the Romans could not make such engineering things themselves yet. So this is one of the oldest Roman walls in Rome and it's just outside of Termini but most people just don't know that it is there. So the first thing that we're going to see is the temple of Minerva Medica. And this is the path from the Termini railway station to that site. And you just basically go along the railway lines, which are behind the wall. And you go, and you go, and in about, I would say, 10 or 15 minutes, you reach this kind of structure, which is completely unguarded, and unmusified, so it's not a museum or anything, it's just like that. And uh, a chance traveler or somebody who walks the street would not even guess that this is a building that is 1,700 years old. This structure uh, is traditionally called uh, the Temple of Minerva Medica, so Minerva the healer, even though the real temple, which Cicero mentions, uh, was elsewhere on the Esculent Hill. Uh, the, this this um, chaotic situation arose because uh, in the 16th century, in those ruins, a famous statue of Athena, or Minerva, was found. Uh, but again, this is just a rumor. The statue was probably found elsewhere. Uh, and uh, going through a number of owners, it is now based in the Vatican Museums. But almost for sure, these two guys were found in that structure. Uh, right now, they are in the wonderful Roman museum, which is called Centrale Monte Martini. This is a, a, a former electrical station, and this is a, a kind of a, a part of the Catholic Capitoline Museums, but it's completely in a completely different space with all those uh, 19th and early 20th century power structures, uh, and there are a lot of those um, statues. 
Uh, they are probably two officials, maybe father and son, <coughs> who are signaling the beginning of a chariot race. So this guy is holding a kind of a napkin, and when he drops the napkin, the chariots will rise, will, will uh, start, will rise. Uh, the building itself, this Minerva Medica, was thought to be a decorative fountain, uh, but it's not very likely. It's more likely that it was a kind of a dinner pavilion. Uh, and um, the cupola, which you can see on this Piranesi engraving, was there until uh, 1828, so it only collapsed rather recently. Before that, you would actually see the, the cupola of this thing. And this is how, uh, without a roof, and uh, surrounded by some kind of agricultural landscape, uh, it survived to these days. Uh, the historian uh, who wrote about the later Roman Empire uh, wrote um, some of, about some of the orgies that were happening in that structure. Whenever he, that is one of the emperors of the time, whenever he went to the gardens named after him, all the stuff of the palace followed him. And, um, and they went with him to the prefects and the chiefs of all the staffs. And they were invited to his banquets and bathed in the pools along with the prince. Women too were often sent in, beautiful girls with the emperor, but with the other ugly old hags. And he used to say that he was making merry, whereas he had brought the world on all sides to ruin. So, and this is more or less what is happening to Minerva Medica as well, <clears throat> even though, in a sense, it's nice that such a huge and basically important ancient Roman structure is completely unprotected by anything and you can just go up to it and have a look. So the next point that we're going to visit is Porto Maggiore, so one of the, uh, one of the gates of the city, of the old city, and the tomb of Eurysas' baker. <coughs> And this is the route that we are going to take from Minerva Medica. And we will come to the wall and we will see the travelling blocks of, the, of, the, um, of that wall, which seem to be very rough. Uh, and this is made on purpose, because they were made in the era of the Emperor Claudius. And Claudius uh, was fond of everything that was ancient, of everything that, uh, that reminded him of hoary antiquity. Uh, and the architecture of his time is designed to be archaic. So, if you go to the other side of the wall, <coughs> uh, you will see the tomb. Uh, and uh, this is it. It's on the other side of the wall because it was forbidden to bury people inside the city. All the cemeteries of the ancient room were always on the roads leading out of the cities. Uh, but um, this tomb was only found uh, relatively recently in the 19th century because in the Middle Ages the Claudian Gate looked like that and they were built up with all kinds of additional structures from all sides, so that tomb was covered by those structures and it was not well known that it was inside. So the Pope Gregory XVI decided to, uh, to remove some of those structures in 1837 and uh, under one of the towers that were disassembled uh, a huge monument was found uh, which couldn't be seen before and it's Concrete core uh, was decorated with travertine, uh, and on each of the signs you can see um, the writing, the the, um, the the sign that that is on that grave, which says this in Latin: "Est hoc monumentum marci Virgili Erisacis Pistoris Redemptoris apart." The last word apart is not very clear, but everything else is rather clear. This is the monument of Mark Vigilius Eurysacus, 
uh, baker and deliverer and supplier. Uh, so this was a guy uh, who was a baker and who was very proud of his job because the whole tomb, a huge tomb, uh, is decorated with the signs of his work. And there are even ideas that those uh, holes uh, are actually the parts of um, a kind of a baking appliance that were specifically put into the grave to remind everyone who was, uh, who was what was the profession of the, of the man buried there. Um, and there are some other pictures which show the actual stages of making bread. Next to the two, there was found another relief which was uh, picturing a man and a woman uh, and um, um, a funerary urn which was shaped like a bread basket uh, and another plug uh, which was uh, which had a, a, um, a writing dedicated to Atistia, the wife of the uh, of the of the baker. Uh, it, it was saying that Atistia was my wife and a wonderful woman and whatever is left of her body is in this bread basket. <laughs> this is that uh, sign. Um, the last name <coughs> of the baker, Eurysetus, uh, is Greek, which means that he was not Roman by birth, that he was probably um, a freedman. Uh, and um, that, for a long time, um, influenced the interpretation of this tomb in scientific literature, because people saw that as a sign of somebody who grew rich uh, from, from, uh, from nothing, uh, and uh, had a very bad taste. And that's why he built this huge tomb. Uh, but uh, you can see that differently, because after all, there was somebody who worked up his life, and wanted to celebrate uh, his job and the process of making bread and so on, uh, which is probably not such a bad affair. So you see that there are lots of bread making design, bread -making <coughs> situations that degrade that too. <coughs> From the tomb of Eurysatis, we'll go to the Nymphaeum of, of Alexander Severus. Um, Severus means, well, means severe in, in um, uh, Latin as well as in English, and uh, in Russian it's very similar to the word north, which sometimes creates uh, uh, an strange situation because it doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> it's difficult to, uh, to understand what is the meaning of this building from the outside, but if you go around it, which is quite possible, because it's just in a square uh, and you can quite freely go around it, uh, you can see a large uh, opening which was from for the aqueduct, for the water which was flowing into and thus making this half out. Uh, there are all kinds of various later uh, sculptures decorating the Indian film now. And uh, this fountain uh, is standing between two walls of, uh, between two uh, sets of protective walls. The old servant walls and the newer railing. Uh, the new, uh, the name of uh, the Emperor Alexander Sever, who is uh, pictured here, uh, is rather um, hazy because it's not quite certain that he was the one who built that fountain. Um, and this is he as well, who looks a little bit like, like an enemy, I think. <coughs> And uh, this is another picture of him, so not a sculpture, but a picture. And this is, by the way, very interesting because uh, Alexander Severus was originally from Africa. Uh, and uh, you can see, in, even in this picture, 
that he was quite dark skinned. It was he black? There was recently a scandal with a famous classical philologist from Cambridge, Mary Beard, um, where I think there was a kind of a, a cartoon or something where some of the ancient Rome uh, uh, characters were black. But, and there was a row, and Nassim Taleb also said some things about that and so on. But I think it's completely possible because. Um, the tradition of portraying, for example, all women as very light-skinned was uh, not realistic. It was it was a kind of a cosmetic um, necessity. Uh, his wife, Yulia Domna, uh, was of Syrian origin, so quite probably she wasn't light-skinned either, uh, and this does not explain anything. Uh, but uh, an important thing to understand is that the ancient Romans did not have the same concept of race as we do. They simply did not um, qualify people into races because they, um, they didn't understand what that was. Uh, and from that point of view, we might have thought that Alexander Severus was a black African, but that wouldn't say anything to the Romans. Uh, but the materials that were used in that fountain that we saw were probably used much later uh, and it was built during the uh, times of the Emperor Domitian and this is the uh, coin of Alexander Severus with the fountain. Um, the fountain during the time when it was in full swing uh, looked like a three-part Triumphal Arch, uh, and uh, there were huge uh, uh, niches there uh, with uh, statues, uh, and those statues um, <coughs> on the sides. What was what was in the center is not quite clear. It was what was on the sides is quite uh, well known because they were reliefs with uh, military. Um, military gear, uh, and uh, this is called a trophy, uh, and they survived, but they were removed uh, in 1590 by the Pope VI, uh, who took them and uh, removed them to the upper um, part of the staircase which leads to the Capitoline Hill, uh, and they are standing there to this day. Uh, the uh, writing here says a lot of good things about 65th. And in film, this de decorative fountain uh, is basically a fountain dedicated to a nymph. And the um, original idea of that came from the story of uh, Numa Pompilius, the one of the first Roman kings, uh, who was, um, was taught many wise things by a nymph called Egeria and the original nymph found was uh, near the Athen Road, not far from Rome, and this is it. Uh, it also survives in some paintings by Goethe, for example, and in an engraving by Peronese. So next we'll see the arch of Gallienus. Uh, and this is not very far. It survives between two blocks of buildings. There were two churches before. Um, and this arch marked the very old Esquiline Hill, uh, Esquiline Gate of Rome. If you go outside of the arch, you will be outside the very old Roman boundary. Um, this was the place where uh, in some very ancient times, the Romans uh, put a stop to uh, certain Etruscan uh, atrocities because the Etruscans were, uh, were trying to find to, to steal the, the uh, cattle. Uh, but uh, at one point, the Romans made uh, an ambush, and when the Etruscans went, went to steal the cattle, they came out of the ambush and killed them all. Uh, so that stopped the Etruscans. Uh, Great. 
this etching by Veronese of 1756 shows that at one point that arch was completely devoid of any structures outside. Uh, but even in Veronese's time, because this is also a Veronese's engraving, you see that uh, certain buildings appeared to the sides. The fact that it, the, this arch is called the Arch of Gallienus is not very um, exact. Uh, it was built or rebuilt uh, back in the time of the Emperor Augustus, so it's very old. Uh, and there were small pedestrian arches, arches on both sides of it. Uh, but as happens with so many things in Rome, they were built for uh, building materials during the Renaissance. Uh, in the 3rd century AD, uh, a rich courtier uh, called Aurelius Victor uh, put down the uh, Augustan inscription on the arch uh, and made another which was by himself. Uh, and it says this, His Eminence, Aurelius Victor, to Galienus, most merciful prince, whose invincible valor is surpassed by his, by his goodness alone, and to Salomina, most blameless Augusta, in greatest dedication to the Alphoidian. And, the and uh, this inscription is full of uh, superlatives, of issimus and issime, uh, but it did not save the Emperor Gallienus from the usual law of barracks emperors of the 3rd century. The 3rd century was a horrible century for Roman emperors, because most of them uh, not uh, survived their emperorship and they were killed after just a few years of service. There were several dozen of them. Uh, so uh, Gallienus was killed during the siege of Milan. Um, there is also uh, a part of the inscription which does not survive and that part probably um, mentions the father of Gallienus, the emperor um, Valerian, uh, whose fate was even more tragic. In the year uh, 260, to the horror of the whole Roman world, uh, he was taken prisoner by the army of the Persian, Pers Persian uh, uh, king Shapur I. Uh, and two years later, he would die or he was killed uh, in, in prison. <laughs> Roman warriors, Roman soldiers, uh, built in the Persian desert uh, a city called Bishapur. It's uh, in the south, in the south of today's Iran, not far from the Persian Gulf. Uh, and the walls of that city are decorated with wonderful re reliefs that show, rather uniquely, uh, for European art at least. Uh, the situation when a European, a Roman army, was conquered and, uh, and uh, uh, defeated by a barbarian, by a Persian army. So this is one of the rare examples when you can see uh, the Roman army through the eyes of the barbarians. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the Bishop War reliefs. And this is a coin which shows Galileans on one side and the goddess uh, Diana on the other. Okay, there is a Torre de, de, de Conti, which is a, uh, a medieval fortified tower. And then we turn right and we go along the Via dei Fuori Imperiali, so the road of the Imperial Forums, with many beautiful buildings, but unfortunately there are real Imperial Forums underneath that street, which was laid by Mussolini uh, without any regard for archaeological uh, wealth of the area. So you see the Colosseum in the distance and uh, the theater of Marcellus. And the upper floor of the theater, that building of Augustan times, uh, is a block of flats, uh, which uh, several years ago I think there was an advertisement in the Guardian which said that those flats were for sale. Uh, and I think that they are, they've been sold now, I don't know to who, but it's quite interesting to know. Uh, because actually that is probably one of the uh, very few examples where you can live more or less in a building that is several thousand years old.
Servizio Chiesa di Santa Maria in Portico e Capitelli. E la famosa fontana delle tortoise uh, della tartaruga, che è anche conosciuta da questo piazza Matei, e c'è una famosa poem by the novel uh, Loret Poet and Joseph Brodsky. Uh, this is uh, called Lago di Torre Argent Argentina and quite next to it we find those columns. Uh, and they were, they were found in Mussolini's times and actually Mussolini uh, was very careful about those uh, Roman remains that he found, not about those that he uh, kind of didn't care about, but those that were found, he usually stopped all other works there and he said, okay, let's preserve that. Uh, but it's not clear what they are. Uh, and there are several guesses about that. Um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, hypotheses was that uh, it was a port, uh, a part of the uh, porticus, which was meant, it was called porticus frumentaria, uh, which meant that it was um, serving people who were coming there to get their bread. And this is a fresco from Pompeii, where you see people getting bread, uh, but they're not actually coming there and buying, for, buying bread or paying for it. Uh, they're kind of coming there according to a certain um, Quarter, uh, which they are uh, they are assigned, and they have documents. They have like a set of like small uh, pieces of marble or uh, or ceramic, where it's written what they are entitled to, and they are given their portion of uh, of um, grain. Uh, this this was a very typical Roman tradition, and uh, in Pompeii. Uh, amazingly, um, some uh, breads of that time were preserved. Uh, they carbonized, so they, they, they were baked by the, by the roughs on the volcano, uh, and they survived for 2,000 years. And interestingly, you see here the, the stamp, which is not a modern stamp, not a museum stamp, but it's a stamp <coughs> of, of Roman times, because the Romans were very bureaucratic, and they like to stamp their bread or their uh, bricks, for example, with the signs saying that uh, it was made by them or that baker uh, and intended for this or that purpose. <clears throat> Another version is that those columns were um, belonged to the temple of Laris Permani, Permanini. And Laris Permanini are kind of marine. Um, deities which protected ships, sailors, and other other uh, marine things. Mm. And uh, it's possible that the temple was built uh, thanks to a victory which the Romans um, had against this guy who is called Antioch the Third or Antioch the Great, um, and. Um, it's possible that the, the, the uh, columns were dedicated to him. Um, the, this is a, a, a possible likeness of Hannibal, uh, who was, after his defeat in Italy, uh, traveling around, and as, uh, as uh, um, my um, publisher Carl said, like, uh, like Tony Blair, um, uh, giving advice to various um, potentates and kings and, and so on. And uh, he was serving Antioch as well. Uh, so one day um, Antioch uh, was creating his troops before his famous consultant. Uh, they were infantry with gleaming uh, shields and horses with golden brides, and elephants and lavishly embroidered saddle blankets. And the king said, what do you think? Would that be sufficient for the roads? That army. I guess it would, said Hannibal, even though they are extremely weak. <laughs> so 
So the next thing we have a look at is a very curious thing. It's a marble food, and it's indeed a marble food. <laughs> uh, and we go along a narrow street, and if you go along those streets late in the evening, it's quite possible, especially in winter, not to find anyone at all there. Um, and go by Piazza Minerva, and you see the Pantheon there, but we're not going there. And you see the church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, which is one of the wonderful Roman churches. It's one of the very few Gothic churches in Rome, even though it's not Gothic on the outside, but inside it is. And it also has one of Michelangelo's sculptures inside. And quite soon you'll find this. This. And even the uh, street that goes by is called Via de Via de Marmo, so the street of the marble food. Uh, but what is this food? It's ancient, certainly, it's ancient Rome. Uh, but it's very hard to say whose it is. Uh, quite possibly, it belonged to some kind of an oriental deity who were very popular in Rome at some point in the um, at the end of the 1st and the beginning of the 2nd century. For example, uh, that guy on the right, and this is a male food, it's rather obvious from the, from the type of sandal that he wears. Uh, that guy on the right is called Serenus, or Serenus, uh, who was a, a, a Greek-Egyptian god. And he was devised, devised during the 3rd century BC on the orders of Ptolemy I of Egypt as a means to unify the Greeks and Egyptians in his realm. So he was a kind of a Greek god, but <coughs> also good for the Egyptians. And he's always portrayed with that kind of urn on his head, so he's rather easily recognized. Uh, so perhaps it was Serapis himself, or one of his uh, priests, who were, again, very numerous in Rome at some point, and the Egyptian priests in Rome um, were shaving their hands. So the, uh, the, the busts that are found, when you, you find a bust of a person who, who is completely thin shaven, who has no hair at all, that usually means that as a priest of, a, of an Egyptian cult. So <clears throat> the next thing we see uh, is the table um, or the tablet of Emperor Claudius on Pomerum expansion. Pomerum is the uh, sacred boundary of the city, so the need to expand that was connected to some important um, uh, in, in industrial and uh, religious significance. Claudius was uh, one of the better known Roman emperors who um, was called to power quite uh, unexpectedly and he was so afraid that as you, as you see here in this, in this prayer of life painting uh, he was just hiding after the death of Nero because uh, he was afraid that he would be killed as well uh, but he was found by Praetorian soldiers and invited to, uh, to, to become their emperor and there is another version of that scene. Claudius was known uh, as an idiot by many contemporaries, uh, but he was actually uh, an intellectual uh, and he wrote books uh, which unfortunately did not survive. He wrote the history of the Etruscan language and we know much less about the Etruscan language because this, uh, this book did not survive and he was quite a progressive person um, politically, because in, uh, in France uh, a huge tablet was found which uh, described his uh, argument with the Senate where he was persuading the Senate to accept uh, people from Gaul uh, to be their senators and uh, the Roman senators were saying but our fathers, our grandfathers <coughs> were uh, making war against the Gauls uh, and Claudius was saying, well, you know, uh, our great-grandfathers uh, were making war against the Etruscans, and look at us now, right? You can tell who is Roman and who is Etruscan. 
and uh, his uh, his suggestion went through. So uh, it was inscribed with stone and set in gold um, uh, in today's France, uh, with um, I think with the feeling of, of, of a victory. Um, he also had uh, um, a wife, Valeria Vistalina, who was um, plotting against him and even uh, married some other guy while being married to him. And immediately after that, it was clear that it was a major uh, breach of protocol and everything, and she was uh, taken care of. <coughs> what is uh, also um, invented some new letters for the Latin alphabet. And these are the letters of Claudius, which are used on that uh, tablet, which I showed you, and on some other writings which belong to that period. But they were immediately forgotten after, after uh, the death of Claudius. So the next thing we see are the baths of Piazza Farnese. Uh, and these baths um, and here, by the way, you see uh, soldiers and uh, uh, military car, and sometimes there is even a uh, kind of a, an armored vehicle. Uh, and unfortunately, these days in Rome, these things are increasingly frequent. Uh, this is the Palazzo Farnese, uh, which is the French embassy. <coughs> In Rome, it was um, handed over by Mussolini to the French uh, until I think 2035 or so for the equivalent of approximately one euro per month. Uh, so, for the time being, and this is a very beautiful Renaissance palace with lots of interesting frescoes inside and so on, but you can very rarely go there because it's an official French building. Um, those baths were actually found in, in the baths of Caracalla. Uh, and uh, this is a huge uh, complex of baths uh, in the outskirts of Rome. Uh, and uh, there uh, you could find not just the baths like those, uh, but uh, many uh, masterpieces of ancient art, for example, the Hercules here, the so-called Farnese Hercules, so also Farnese, uh, which was an important family of the time, uh, which went to the um, to the uh, archaeological museum in Naples, as well as this statue of Dursi uh, and the bull. So this, these are uh, the uh, ancient Greek heroes, Thes and Amphion, who are tying. Uh, their uh, their tormentor, their their enemy uh, to the to the uh, horns of the bull, um, and uh, this is uh, more or less almost the begin the, the, the end of our walk. But uh, I would like to take you to one more place, and that will be a kind of an addendum. Uh, this is a cemetery, and I'm not taking you. Uh, to the cemetery at the end because it's a cemetery, but because it's a very nice and interesting place, uh, which is called in uh, in Italian Cimitero Cattolico, so a non Catholic cemetery, but in English it's usually called the Protestant cemetery, even though that's not correct because there you can find not just Protestants but also uh, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox and Italian atheists, as you will see, and other people. Uh, seven years ago, um, a couple of years ago, I was in Rome and I went on a tour uh, which um, concentrated on the food of Trastevere, so that's the other side of the, of, of the Tiber, um, where um, people really, there are fewer ancient Roman monuments and people People live more in the Italian way, uh, and they probably eat, uh, well, if not better, then more authentic food. Uh, and so uh, our um, American guide uh, showed us around and pointed out some shops and restaurants and, uh, and 
ice cream places, uh, and pasta places, and so on. And one of the points, or a cultural point, not an eating point, was the uh, the uh, this Protestant cemetery. Uh, this is exactly that. There, um, this monument is the so-called Pyramid of Cestius, which is an ancient Roman monument, which was very recently restored and cleaned, because uh, you see that it's very white, but uh, it used to be quite blacker. Uh, recently it was restored with the money of a Japanese tycoon, uh, and also a very interesting monument about which almost nothing is known, even who was the Cestius is very unclear. Uh, and uh, the cemetery itself uh, is quite an interesting place because you see all kinds of various uh, tombs, mostly are, there are two parts, the older part and the newer part, and especially the older part, uh, you see a lot of, uh, of English and American people buried there, including, for example, the uh, grave of, uh, of uh, John Keats, the famous poet, and another famous poet, person, Michi Shelley, who was also also <coughs> died, uh, drowned uh, not far from Rome. Um, but there are, as I said, uh, some of the tombs that are not belonging to, uh, to uh, <coughs> Protestants, for example, uh, to Antonio Gramsci, who was an Italian communists, communist, uh, or to this guy who is uh, called Karl Brulov, and I'm sure that the Russians here know quite well who Karl Brulov is. Karl Brulov was one of the most famous Russian painters of the 19th century, and his by far most famous painting uh, is a painting from, uh, I think, something like 1832 or 33, which is called The Last Day of Pompeii. Uh, and, uh, there was a novel by um, British author uh, Edward Baldwin Lytton, which is called The Last Day of Pompeii as well, which was written after Brulov, and it was named after this picture. And uh, Brulov toured with this painting all around Europe, and he was let through immediately as soon as people, especially in Italy, heard that he was that famous painter who painted the last day of Pompeii. And that painting was also the uh, beginning of a new, huge um, era of uh, popularity of Pompeii. So people flocked there as tourists uh, in droves, um, unlike in previous, year, in previous years, even though Pompeii was the first actual uh, almost scientific archaeological dig. But it was only after the, the 1830s, after Brilov and Bulbalitin, that people really started to go there, and the royalty and all the famous people, and there were people trying to uh, put some new uh, skeletons and to show them to the royalty and to say that, well, you know, look, it's such a beautiful skeleton. Um, and there are pictures to that effect. Um, I'm showing this uh, in a sense because uh, I'm now thinking of um, another um, book. Uh, which will not be centered on Pompeii, but it will feature Pompeii and to be dedicated to various natural disasters that happened to, uh, to the humanity in the last several thousand years. And I think uh, this uh, horrifying but beautiful picture is uh, a nice way to think about uh, the um, the uh, fate of ancient Rome, which is no longer with us, but it's still with us as a very important cultural concept that informs and illuminates every path of our life. Thank you very much. I just asked a couple of questions to um, Victor because I, I, I haven't seen that talk before. And it's, a, it's a wonderful way of bringing the book to life. But I, while anybody thinks of any questions, I have one or two for you. I think one of the things you show is that one small object, a plant or a foot or whatever it is, is a kind of doorway into a much bigger picture. Yes. And in a way, if you do the conventional tourist thing, um, you can be so overwhelmed. I mean, if you're going to the Forum, if you're going to the Pantheon, if you're going to the Colosseum, 
probably every part of that has the same sort of story. So it's a very clever way of looking into what is obviously a complex society. But what I'm quite interested in is whether you you walked around Rome uh, for months on end looking for these little things, making a list and then finding out about them, or whether you somehow knew about them first and then went and explored them. I mean, how did you? Because the book is full of such things. I mean, this is just a selection. Uh, well, um, I think that the second version of uh, knowing most of those things in advance is closer to the truth. Because, uh, as I said, there are excellent archaeological guides which tell you where these things are and what they are, uh, but they don't usually tell you an interesting story behind that and many stories that can surround that. Uh, so, basically, uh, you can look up Amanda Claridge's book and you will see, I think, more or less all of those objects there. Uh, they just do not form a narrative. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Uh, gentleman in front row. Yes, um, fascinating talk, thank you. Uh, you mentioned about you mentioned about the Etruscans, you mentioned about Egyptians, uh, you mentioned about Gauls, and uh, as as the Roman Empire ex expanded, to what extent did uh, Rome, the city of Rome, become a, a, a multi, multicultural society. Were, were, were other cultures assimilated as, as London today, or, or did they have little effect on the society? Uh, Rome was multicultural to a great extent. First of all, we have to understand that the, uh, the ancient Roman society itself was expanding from a very narrow forest. So Rome basically initially was even at war with its nearest neighbor, the town of Alba Longa, which is just, you know, uh, you can go there in half a day. Uh, and, uh, um, and they were bitter enemies. And then there was a kind of a, a battle between the Horashi and the Kuriashi and the Romans won. Uh, and Rome slowly started expanding, <coughs> assimilating more and more people. For example, there, there was a tribe of the Sabines, uh, which was um, uh, uh, at, at war with Rome until the first century BC. Uh, so until very historic times, not some very boring uh, ancient times. Uh, but still, after after they were assimilated, maybe they were Romans. And uh, I think that was very important uh, about Romans that they were prepared to accept uh, those people who were ready to, to say, well, okay, now we're Romans. And the Romans didn't have anything against that. Uh, there was, for example, a um, uh, uh, um, Jewish community in Rome, uh, which was kind of separate, and, uh, and the Jews were even excused from the usual um, religious requirements of, of ancient Rome because for example, when you had to sacrifice something and so on uh, you, uh, you had to go along certain rules of wrong, re wrong religion and that was one of the problems with the Greeks because they didn't want to do that uh, but uh, whereas with the Christians especially the new Christians like those Christians who were Romans the Romans were not prepared to accept that out of the question. With the Jews, uh, whose religion was very ancient, they were prepared to say that it's okay. And there was a, a Jewish community in Rome, at least in the first century BC, so before Christianity in the times of Caesar. <clears throat> and as Rome expanded, uh, many people from all kinds, uh, from all lands of the, of the empire were coming to Rome and lived in Rome and traded in Rome. Um, and uh, Greek, which was certainly the second language of many educated Romans, was spoken everywhere in Rome. So Rome was a truly multinational uh, state, uh, multinational society in that sense. I've never seen that picture of that done before, but it's interesting that you say 
you probably have darker skin, therefore that would fit in. Yes, yes, that's quite possible. Yeah. Yeah. I just wondered what made you first interested in ancient Something that you started as a child? Um, well, in a sense, yes. In a sense, yes. Perhaps it was, you know, a, an expression of my uh, of my decision not to make classical philology my profession, because I didn't uh, I didn't study Latin and Greek and ancient literature at the university, but it still remained something that kind of. Uh, kind of was very important for me, and uh, I I read and studied uh, all the time. So at some point, I decided that it was a good way to to, to move that forward. So it was uh, somehow uh, I find that this beginning of everything that unites European culture uh, is very important and uh, worth studying and knowing. And probably bringing it uh, in some uh, some uh, acceptable form to a broader audience. Um, I was actually going to ask you about the translation because you had this great opportunity to translate your own work, your own Russian book. How do you find was it identical, or did you create something new in the English? Uh, it's not identical. Uh, I did create. Well, you, here, uh, the good thing about translating your own work, your own work, is that you don't need to be absolutely faith, faithful, right? Because uh, you, you don't answer to yourself, you don't have to, to answer to the author, because you are the author. Uh, and so I cut some of the references that were only clear for, for a Russian reader, and I added some that were uh, better suited to, to, uh, to a British reader. And actually, my yesterday's talk at Cambridge was devoted to that issue, uh, and I talked at length about various decisions that I had to take: cutting, or writing, or changing, or somehow um, modeling things, and so on. But it was so it's well suited to the English audience. Sorry. Your English version is suited uh, to the, the English audience. Uh, I hope so. Yes, I think it is. And one, one of the things that's quite interesting is, is in addition to knowing all about Rome, you clearly know about English society mm -hmm. and the sort of things, the, the sort of expressions, the sort of references, you know, the Simpsons are in there, in fact, although maybe they're in the Russian version. I, I think well. not. I think not. Because, uh, exactly because the, the, the kind of joke that is there. It's it's very poorly translatable into Russian. But how do you how did you acquire in parallel with your knowledge of Rome? How have you acquired your knowledge of, of Simpsons? No, <laughs> <laughs> even broader than the Simpsons of Western social life, interests, popular culture. I mean, well, I've been reading more or less all my life, and I've been work I, I've worked for several years in a. European institution uh, and uh, England has always been uh, a country that was of great in interest to me and, and English literature and English language and so on. So I, I, I don't think there was any kind of a special device, it's just, just something that happened. Okay. Well, I think that the Russian version is a little bit longer uh, because it has a, a, a chapter about Ostia and Tivoli, which are not strictly Rome, but <coughs> next to Rome, they, uh, they are not very good um, topographically. So, uh, if, if you are a tourist walking there, that's perhaps not, the, not, the, uh, not, not a very good guide to those places. Uh, there were many other interesting stories in them which I managed to uh, transfer to other parts of the book. And the other, uh, Italian city or any city in the world? Uh, not Italian city. Uh, I am, as, as I said, I am thinking about the uh, the disasters that struck the humanity during the last several thousand years, and they cover the whole world. That last chapter on Brexit. That kind of disaster. <laughs> Rome was founded more or less 
in the 8th century BC and it survived until uh, at least the 5th century AD. Uh, I think uh, compared to that, uh, the Soviet Empire didn't exist. <laughs> so it's not worth comparing. Really. <laughs> I'm not sure that when you speak about Rome, uh, there is much that is perceived completely differently by the Russian and the English. Uh, I was speaking yesterday, for example, about the uh, British Scottish architect Charles Cameron, who is very well known in Russia because he built beautiful buildings at the request of Catherine the Great, uh, but absolutely unknown uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, that, that is perhaps an example of those things, uh, but um, as for various things wrong that are uh, that are perceived differently in Russia and in, in England, I'm not sure that there are such things. As for the decline of Rome, well, um, it happened. It started to happen back in Roman times. So at the end of the Roman Empire, the centers of imperial power were far from Rome. The, the empire split into West and Eastern, there was Constantinople, and there was Milan, or Medellin, and there was Tibir in Germany, which was also a very uh, uh, important point, and, and so on. So Rome really was losing importance, and it was losing and losing it. It was <coughs> uh, the, the river silted, and uh, malaria was very um, prominent there, so at some point from the population of about one million, uh, it shrank to something like maybe 10,000 or so who were, um, who were on a tiny piece of the, what is now called the Martian field. Uh, and the Forum and many other places of ancient grandeur were indeed abandoned. But they didn't um, last forever because then the Renaissance came and the Popes came and they started rebuilding and pilfering and uh, rebuilding again, and by, let's say, the 14th, 15th century, uh, Rome was great again, and we have Michelangelo, and we have St. Peter's, and Vatican, and everything else. Uh, so, I think um, a place like Rome um, is, um, has a kind of a, a, of a theme, or heart of culture that cannot be extinguished uh, completely. It, it, will, it will be reborn at some point, and it was. Any more questions before we close? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, we're going to ask, uh, what do you think about the uh, secrets of success? Because they managed to build an incredible empire, different sorts of success, taking different figures, but some say it's a uh, one force, one force population of the world. Uh, Well, I think the ingredients of success. Yeah, the ingredients of success and why why the Romans were so successful. Well, you have to remember uh, that um, in spite of all their success, the Roman Empire did come to an end, and the, that success turned into a failure and uh, inability to withstand the assault of barbarian tribes and so on. But I think that what uh, Virgil said in the Aeneid. Uh, was very important that the Romans knew very well what they were good at and what they were not very good at. Uh, at one point, Aeneas, the main character of the Aeneid, goes um, into the other world and meets his dead father. And his dead father tells him the future story of Rome. And among other things, he says that. Um, uh, other people, and these are mostly the Greeks, other people will uh, understand the skies and geometry and the laws and so on. But you, Rome, your business is to, um, to lead the nation, uh, to reward 
your allies and <coughs> to uh, subdue those who do not want to be to be your allies. So basically, uh, this kind of a um, structure um, was very important for Romans because they, they really understood quite well that uh, various fine things were not suited to their mind. And even uh, even uh, even though we have great um, literature and so on, uh, everything else, like for example medicine or uh, science, was indeed mostly made by Greeks and other people who were, were not Roman. So politics, uh, law, um, and later literature. So the Romans knew where to concentrate their efforts, and I think that that's an important uh, part of success. Thank you. Uh, there, there'll be an opportunity to mingle a little bit more if you want to. Get, I think that's the case. If you want to get a drink and a biscuit and talk to Victor afterwards, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I think it's a terrific turnout, and I'd like to thank Victor for coming and giving such a wonderful talk. And shall we give it a? Uh,